So, um, good evening. Uh, I'm a volunteer with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. And since, uh, since 1970, the Environmental Society has been working on important issues such as sustainable energy and climate solutions, water protection, biodiversity preservation, and reduction of toxic substances in our environment. Aren't already a member? We encourage you to join. You can always find out more about our diverse projects, activities, and how to get involved by checking our website at www.environmentalsociety.ca. We'd like to receive email notification of events in the sustainability speaker series. There's a sign up sheet on the table near the entrance to this room. This evening, our speaker is Brett Dalter. He's an assistant professor in economics at the University of Regina. His PhD is from York University in Ontario. He has two master's degrees, one in economics from the University of Victoria, and one in resource management and environmental studies from the University of British Columbia. Among the subjects he teaches are climate change policy, cost benefit analysis, and ecological economics. His research has included the impact of carbon pricing in Canada and strategies for reducing greenhouse gas emissions of the Canadian electrical system. The title of Brett's presentation is Greening the Saskatchewan Electrical Grid. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Carol, for the introduction, and thanks to the Saskatchewan Environmental Society for the invitation. Uh, I can see some familiar faces out there, so I'm uh, excited to present and then also to hear from you. I, I find that I always learn uh, from, especially from those of you uh, who've been thinking about this issue for a long time uh, in Saskatoon. I'm sorry I can't be there today. I have some other uh, commitments, but thanks for allowing me to, to be here virtually through Zoom. Uh, and thanks to the library also for hosting. Uh, so I'm here in Regina, uh, Treaty 4 territory. And uh, today I'm going to talk about the costs of different options for greening the Saskatchewan electricity grid. And I'm going to be fairly narrow in terms of the costs. I'm going to be talking mainly about the cost to build the power plants, operate the power plants uh, of various kinds. Uh, so I wanted to put that disclaimer up front and I'll be talking about some options without giving you sort of a, you know, one pathway, but, uh, but we'll look at some of the modeling studies that have shown us different pathways and have given us some idea of what it might mean for the cost of electricity going forward. Uh, so in this presentation, I'm, I'll try to go quickly through the first few slides. So those of you who I recognize out there, I know already know a lot about climate change and the context that we're operating in here. Uh, but I'll talk about climate change quickly, our policies that exist in electricity. Then I'll start going into the options that we have in Saskatchewan for uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and getting to zero emissions in the electricity sector uh, before I talk about costs and what we could do if there's any uh, negative impacts on ratepayers. So with that, I will launch into the presentation here. Uh, here I've got a, a picture you might recognize. This is taken in June 2021. Uh, in Lytton, BC. So Lytton, BC registered the highest temperature that we've ever seen in Canada at 49.6 degrees Celsius. And then a day later, the heat and the dry conditions led to a fire that destroyed the whole town. Um, that, that was part of the North American heat wave, which killed over 1,400 people, including at least 100 or 808 in Western Canada, quite a few in BC. Uh, I wanted to start with this just to put in context that we're already seeing climate impacts today. We're seeing serious impacts and we can expect these to get worse if we don't start to address this problem. I probably don't need to convince too many of you in the room of the reality of climate change, but here's the governor of California in 2020 after a series of fires uh, ripped through that state saying, if you do not believe in science, I hope you believe observed reality. The hots are getting a lot hotter. The wets are getting wetter. The science is absolute. The data is self-evident. The debate is over in terms of climate change. If you don't believe that, just come to the state of California. Uh, they had the 
the worst fire season they'd ever had in the modern era in 2021. So heat waves, fires, these are going to become the norm with climate change. And so we got to think about what we're going to do about it. And we can think about what's going to happen in Saskatchewan. We, what do we know is going to happen here? We'll have that hot heat. So our hot days will be hotter, potentially putting people at risk and potentially leading to heat deaths. Uh, some people talk about how warmer uh, weather might extend the agricultural growing season. But of course, we need that moisture to also be present because more heat is going to lead to more evaporation out of those lands that we're trying to grow crops on. We'll have forest fires that are more likely to happen and harder to control. And we'll have more days like this. This is a photo of the University of Regina where I work uh, in 2018 when we had a lot of forest fires that summer. Hazy conditions that are bad for our health, bad for our children's health. And so in, in, in economics, we'll often talk about a business as usual scenario. Well, when it comes to climate change, there is no business as usual. There's the world getting hotter or there's us getting ourselves off of fossil fuels. And so for the sake of our children and grandchildren, we've got to change our path away from our uh, climate future that we're heading towards. I, I like to use this analogy to get people thinking about climate change, the issue at hand. Uh, you can think about the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere as similar to the a water, level of water filling up a tub. And so Oops, let me back that up. We've already had, we're at 1.1 degrees Celsius warming as a result of the emissions that have flowed into the atmosphere. So the tap of our emissions has been flowing. We've built up the greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. We're trapping that heat. We're already at 1.1 degrees Celsius. To stop at 1.5 degrees Celsius, we don't have much room left in the atmospheric bathtub, enough for maybe 420 to 840 gigatons of CO2. That for two degrees Celsius warming, a bit more room, but there's also the risk of much greater impacts if we let our, our climate heat up that much. We're still releasing 34 to six, 36 gigatons of CO2 per year. And if we wanna stop that bathtub from filling up, stop climate change from getting worse, we need to stop that tap, turn it off. So get our emissions down to zero. And this is, this is something I like to talk about because I think many people might think we just have to reduce pollution or, you know, reduce it by five, 10 percent in order to deal with this problem. And maybe that would reduce the temperature. But this is a, an issue where it's the, the flow we can control. But we already have this level of CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere that's built up. And it's a stock that we've built up. So we have to stop the flow altogether unless we want to keep that stock rising. Here's Greta Thunberg, someone who's helped the world understand this. She says the most perhaps the most dangerous misconception about climate the climate crisis is that we have to lower our emissions because that is far from enough. Our emissions have to stop if we were to stay below 1.52 degrees Celsius warming. Now, many of you already know that, so I won't linger on that. Here's a, a shot of the emissions trajectory uh, the IPCC recommends we take if we want to stay at 1.5 degrees. That's the, the, the blue line, uh, have a good probability of staying at 1.5 or Two degrees Celsius is the gray line. Either way, we're talking about getting to net zero by mid-century, 2040 to 2044, or sorry, to 2055. So what have we been doing about this problem? I've, I've been thinking about it for 20 years already, and uh, many of you have been thinking about it even longer than that. And we've seen this series of attempts to talk about the problem and set targets and try to deal with it. Uh, IP, IPCC formed in 1990, country signed the Kyoto Protocol in 1997. That didn't lead to the binding agreement that would drive emissions down. Uh, Copenhagen, oh, can you still hear me out there? Okay. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, okay. Uh, Copenhagen, more negotiations, uh, more discussion of climate targets uh, that ultimately weren't met. And then, and then we have more recently the Paris Agreement in 2015, where we've set more targets. Meanwhile, the bathtub is filling up. The time is running out to stop this problem and stop temperature increase uh, from getting to the, the, the very uh, risky levels that we're driving it to right now. So we're, we've been wasting a lot of time, and a lot of this has been wasted on 
voluntary policies and information campaigns that really haven't driven emissions down. Uh, now, I've, I've done some work. I did some work with the David Suzuki Foundation on a report called Zeroing In on Our Emissions. We looked at how do you, what are the big actions we need to get to zero? So here's just a quick summary of that. We know we, we need to improve energy efficiency, conserve energy, become more efficient. Number two, and what I'm going to talk about today, we've got to clean up electricity. Number three, we've got to electrify as much as we can. We know if we get clean electricity, we can use it for our vehicles, for our buildings, for heat, uh, and that will help us drive down emissions to zero. Not every use, not every case can, uh, can we can electrify. So long distance freight, air travel, we may not be able to electrify to a great extent. So we've got to think about what well, some low carbon liquid fuels, maybe it's hydrogen, maybe it's biofuels for those cases where we can't electrify. And then we've got to think about industry and how to help industry decarbonize without hurting the competitiveness of any given industry so we don't uh, tank our economy and, and thinking strategically about how we do that. So these are the big actions, but electricity is really at the heart of a lot of what we need to do. Uh, we can see in, in Canada, electricity, not our biggest source of emissions and actually is, in Canada has been a bit of a success story. Uh, but we're still not driving those emissions down to zero the way we need to. Uh, and you can see, you know, we had Kyoto Protocol setting targets for uh, 2012 that weren't met. Copenhagen setting targets for 2020 that weren't met. Paris Agreement setting a more ambitious target. Hopefully we can meet that. We're, we've got to try to, to reach that target. Now, I've said we've been wasting a lot of time with voluntary, non-compulsory policy. There's a great book by Mark Jackard, A Citizen's Guide to Climate Success. It's actually available for free uh, as a PDF online. And he talks about how we can actually drive emissions down, he separates climate policies into two bins, non-compulsory, simply telling people about the problem, uh, incentives to get people to do the right thing, labeling, labeling furnaces, inner, inner guides, stuff like that, or compulsory. And compulsory, there's two main branches, there's regulations or carbon pricing. And as Jackard says, a climate sincere government, if they really wanna drive down emissions, they've gotta be implementing compulsory policy. So they've gotta be implementing regulations and or carbon pricing or some combination. And we have seen that in the electricity sector. So uh, to, to its credit, the, the Harper government was actually the first federal government to introduce coal-fired regulations in 2012. Uh, they set targets for how much emissions each plant could re release, and if it couldn't meet that target, a plant had to be retired at the end of its useful life. That regulation was further strengthened when the Liberal government came to power, and they've made it so that every coal plant in Canada must either emit 420 tons of CO2 emissions per gigawatt hour or less, or be retired by 2030. Uh, so in Saskatchewan, that's affecting our coal power plants in Estevan, the Boundary Dam power plant. Uh, the Shand power plant, and also in Coronac, the Poplar River power plant. So regulation, we're seeing, we know that the end of coal is coming. That's because we have had a compulsory policy. Uh, and it's it's thanks to the federal government that we have that, two different governments federally. We also have carbon pricing. And as much as it gets demonized in Saskatchewan, this is a policy that changes the economics of all of the clean energy. And so carbon pricing is a way to make the clean technology is more cost competitive and make us pay for that pollution when we're not using clean tech. Economists generally really like carbon pricing. Maybe uh, the rest of the world doesn't, but here's uh, Paul Romer, uh, one of the economists who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago for his work on climate policy, saying basically you put the carbon price in place, have it escalate over time, and you find that there's a, people will see there's a big profit to be made from figuring out ways to supply energy or they can do it without incurring the tax. So we know what we need to do. He's saying the problem is getting consensus to act. Canada has acted, and again, to their credit, I think uh, people can be critical of the federal government and, and their ambition, but they've put a price on carbon, which very few regions of the world have managed to do, and they've set a carbon pricing schedule, which is more aggressive than almost any other region of the world. So we, we have a, an effective policy, a compulsory policy in carbon pricing. And the federal government's not done. They're now developing regulations that would lead to 
no longer allowing unabated natural gas plants to operate in Canada. So we have a coal-fired phase out 2030. The federal government is working on clean electricity regulations that will control any new facilities that are built. And so anything built after 2025 will have to be net zero ready so that it will actually be net zero emissions by 2035. Again, compulsory policy that's going to drive down emissions. So that's the regulatory context, the policy context. And again, it's one of the policy success stories, I think, on climate is that we have this effective policy. Uh, but it, it means that we have a challenge in Saskatchewan. So I, I've, I've done work on electricity in Saskatchewan for a few years and, and went back through all of their annual reports, looked at what was generated in each year. And, and here's a graph just showing the percentage of generation that coal has supp supplied in uh, every year that uh, I had available. So I think it's from 1956 to, to 2022. Uh, coal has been a big part of our electricity supply. Uh, it was part of the reason SAS Power was formed was to develop the lignite resources in Southeast Saskatchewan, transmit it around the province and lower the cost of electricity. Now we see in the last couple decades, the purple is gas. Gas has become a bigger chunk of our uh, electricity supply. The blue is hydro. So we haven't had a lot of new hydro, but it's still uh, maintaining a, maybe a 10% share. And you can see the green, just this little uh, line of green that's wind energy that started to pick up. Uh, I actually did include solar in this graph, but it, it's so small right now for how much it contributes that it, you can't see the orange in the graph. Uh, well, we've seen that what SAS Power has been doing has been planning to move away from coal by installing natural gas plants and building wind farms. With the clean electricity regulations, that's no longer going to be possible. It's, you can't have a, just a future of building gas plants in every city. So they've got to think of another uh, path forward. And we know you still have emissions from gas plants. So these are Saskatchewan's emissions now. Uh, we can drive down the emissions somewhat by retiring coal, but you also need to get rid of gas to get those electricity sector emissions down to zero. So what, what comes next? So this is kind of my take on the different things that SAS Power needs to think about, the different things that we think about, have to think about as a province. We think about what our electricity future is going to be. We know that SAS Power installed carbon capture storage on Boundary Dam Unit 3. Uh, and as far as I can tell, it looks very unlikely that they're going to equip any other coal-fired units with carbon capture storage. Uh, Saskatchewan was had, had built the first of a kind globally, full of carbon capture storage. But that meant that the price of that electricity was very high. Uh, without selling the the CO2 to the oil fields, it's about $170 a, mega, a megawatt hour. Uh, when you sell it, it's $140 a megawatt hour, or 14 cents a kilowatt hour, but very expensive electricity that gets generated with that power plant. So we're not going to be the one to build the first of a kind and the second of a kind globally. And really, no jurisdiction has been following our footsteps to build a lot of these plants. What that's going to mean is that these communities that have relied on coal-fired power plants for their economies, local jobs, they're going to be in a period of transition, especially a community like Coronac, where the biggest employers around are the coal-fired power plant and the coal mining uh, dragline. So you, you have people who will need to transition to other employment. It also means you, you have skilled labor in those communities. Uh, got the logo there for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Uh, the map there shows the black See, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but down in the, the south is the Poplar River and around Estevan, the uh, Boundary Dam and Shan power plants. So this, this region, you're going to have skilled workers who could use some employment when these coal-fired power plants are retired and decommissioned. As I said, SAS Power has been turning their focus to natural gas power plants. Uh, here's their capacity, the generating capacity. So natural gas, now the biggest component of SAS Power's electricity generation fleet, uh, but we can't just keep on with unabated gas. Uh, there, we do have an option for those coal-fired uh, power plants. We could look into what's happening in Alberta. In Alberta, they're actually going to be out of coal probably this year. 
because they're converting all their coal-fired power plants to natural gas. That's something we could do in Saskatchewan, but it really only delays that inevitable of having to get off of unabated natural gas. So with the clean electricity regulations, a coal to gas conversion is really a short-term fix. Now there's, there's some discussion about, well, could you put carbon capture storage on a gas plant? And we see a big company like General Electric is looking into this. They're trying to develop that technology. Uh, we haven't seen a plant developed like this before, but they're trying to do a, a gas plant with CCS that would capture 95% of the CO2 emissions. But something to remember when we're talking about natural gas, here's a look at uh, Saskatchewan's supply and demand of natural gas. The shaded gray in the back is Saskatchewan supply, so our, our own domestic natural gas. The blue line is how much we've been using, our demand. And you can see a real drop off after 2006. Uh, even a note here, this is from the Sask Energy Annual Report, that our local domestic supply is declining faster than previously forecasted. So we have less local Saskatchewan gas, which means when we're burning gas in a gas power plant, we're really relying on Alberta imports for that. So it, it's not a, a domestic resource to a great extent. And uh, for those who talk about not wanting to import Manitoba Hydro's electricity, if you're burning gas, you're just importing from your other neighbor there. Not to mention that gas prices are quite volatile. So here's a look at uh, recent years, natural gas prices. We saw the big upward swing when Russia invaded the Ukraine and drove up energy prices all over the world, uh, up to almost $7 a, a gigajoule from lows of you know, around even between $1 to $2 a gigajoule. So big increase in gas costs. That led to problems for SAS Power. Here's the, the minister responsible for SAS Power, Don Morgan, talking about the impact of that price spike, saying, we've had significant increases in some of our supply costs, 38% increase to natural gas, 36% increase to coal, puts a little blame on the carbon tax, which really, you know, we, get, we still get to keep that money. So uh, people always forget that the money still exists. It doesn't disappear. So we still have that carbon pricing revenue we can use. Uh, but he, he, he's noting that natural gas price spikes were a big reason why SAS Power is set to lose $105 million this fiscal year. They don't usually lose money, but the big spike in gas prices, when you have all that gas capacity, has meant that they are going to be losing money this year. And so we've heard from the provincial government, uh, their favored technology going forward is to build a small modular nuclear reactors, build a 300 megawatt nuclear reactor. Uh, this is again, one of these technologies that hasn't been built anywhere in the world. Now we're not looking to build the first one in Canada. Uh, we, we know that SAS Power, if they build something, they're looking at the GE Hitachi uh, small modular reactor, and that's the BWRX 300. And they, would, they wouldn't they would build it until they've seen what happens in Ontario. And so Ontario, Ontario Power Generation, they've signed an agreement with uh, SNC-Lavalin and Acon to build one of these G, GE Hitachi nuclear power plants at the Darlington site where they have existing large reactors. And Saskatchewan can have a look at what happens there and then decide whether this is gonna be uh, even economical. So apart from all of the concerns around nuclear, I think the big question is, is this going to be cost competitive with our other options? Uh, this is the planning timeline SAS Power has put in place. So they won't be deciding on whether to proceed until after 2028 when Ontario is due to have built that nuclear reactor. And if they build one, uh, it would be operational not till 2035. Now, SAS Power has already identified the two sites where they would build a reactor. They need to find places where they've got a lot of water so they can cool the nuclear power plant. And so water availability is a, is a big consideration for these big thermal plants. Uh, it, it becomes a concern, especially when we think about climate change potentially leading to lower stream flows and more heat, more evaporation. Uh, there has to be source of cooling water or else you'll have to actually shut down a nuclear power plant as they had to do in France when they had droughts there. 
Uh, so we, we see that the Lake Diefenbaker is one site. Now, those of you in Saskatoon, this is also upstream from you. This is where your drinking water comes from. Is, you know, most of the province gets their drinking water from uh, that source. Uh, the other site is Estevan area, where you see around, uh, the, they've got Grant Divine Lake and Boundary Dam Reservoir. These reservoirs that were built for the coal-fired power plants uh, could be repurposed for a nuclear power plant. Again, we, we need to be aware and think about how climate change would impact the quality and quantity of water that would be needed to cool these power plants. Uh, thinking about hydro and water availability, we know we live in a very flat province. There's not a lot of capacity for new hydro. Maybe there's some marginal increases we can have uh, adding capacity to existing hydro plants. Uh, the map there showing in dark uh, black are three real, really uh, major rivers that you could possibly think about doing hydro on. So we've got the South Saskatchewan, North Saskatchewan, and then uh, in the north, uh, Churchill. But not a lot of untapped capacity. So this is likely not to be a big part of our, our future supply. And, and hydro can also be vulnerable to these drought years. So the other reason SAS Power is noting that they're losing the $100 million this year is because it was a dry year and it meant it was a low hydro electric output year. Again, climate change having impacts now leading us to uh, have fewer options than we might have for electricity generation. So we look at, well, what, what other things can we do and what, uh, what is SAS Power contemplating? Uh, here's a slide from a presentation SAS Power gave in, in the fall, uh, in October. So they are thinking about building a lot more wind and, and quite a big capacity expansion for solar. You can see 2030 moving from 617 megawatts of wind to 2,000 megawatts of wind, uh, and 2035 being at 2,500 megawatts of wind. So that's that's a lot more wind than we have now. And solar by 2030, looking at maybe up to 834 megawatts of solar. Again, it was a very big increase from where we are now for solar uh, and getting up to 1,000 megawatts of solar by 2035. So we we see the SAS power is thinking about this. They're also, you can see also their 2035 mix, uh, nuclear power plant, SMR, and a gas plant with carbon capture storage. This was put together, I guess, before any details maybe on the clean electricity regulations. So this wouldn't necessarily comply with the federal clean electricity regulations. But SAS power itself is seeing there is an opportunity for much more wind energy here in Saskatchewan. Here's a picture taken at the Swift Current uh, Kite Festival, great festival every year at Swift Current that really highlights the wonderful wind we have in Saskatchewan. Uh, so we know we're a windy place and so we could build a lot more wind capacity. We also know wind has really fallen in cost over the past decade. So from 2009 to 2021, the levelized cost of wind fell by 72%. It's now one of the lowest cost ways to generate electricity. Wind turbines have gotten bigger, they're more efficient, and so they're able to generate electricity at a lower cost and at lower wind speeds. Here's a look at uh, the results of an auction in Alberta. They received wind bids in to supply wind energy as low as $30 a megawatt hour, which is three cents a kilowatt hour. You compare that to our retail rate of 14.7 cents a kilowatt hour. So very low cost wind. And this was a few years ago. Uh, average price there, $37 a megawatt hour. But low cost wind is very possible on the prairies. In Saskatchewan, we have that same wind resource that they have in southern Alberta. Here's a look at wind speeds. You can see throughout Southern Saskatchewan, really good wind speeds, really great potential for wind energy. I, I worked on a paper looking at how we could drive emissions down for all of Canada, built this electricity model that models each province in Canada. And the, the optimal solution this model proposed was to build a lot more wind energy in Saskatchewan. All those orange dots would be places you'd wanna build wind energy. They, correspond pretty closely with that high wind speed map because we're using wind data to uh, determine the economics of those wind facilities. But we can be doing a lot more, like and, and even more than SAS Power's planning. If you, you know, they're planning 2,500 megawatts, we could be thinking even bigger 
and thinking about how Saskatchewan could actually be a wind power exporter. Like talk about 5,000, 7,500, 10,000 megawatts of, of wind where we start to be able to uh, sell and export low cost wind energy to our neighbors east and west, but also sell to the US. To do that, we need better transmission links. So we need new transmission links, ideally high voltage DC links that connect us to US markets and also could connect us uh, you know, at the very least to Manitoba, Manitoba Hydro. Uh, but potentially we found in our research, it makes sense to build high voltage DC transmission links all the way from BC to Manitoba. So that you have that low cost wind and solar in Alberta and Saskatchewan that you can balance out with the hydro in BC and Manitoba. Utility scale solar also could be built out to a great extent. SAS Power is seeing that opportunity. The same cost improvements we saw for wind are happening with solar. Uh, there from 2009 to 2021, the levelized cost of solar was driven down 90%. So we now have very low cost solar compared to where we were 15 years ago. Again, Alberta is a bit more public with their electricity deals. They, they have published that they've signed solar deals where they're paying $48 a megawatt hour for solar energy. That's 4.8 cents a kilowatt hour. That's that's lower than I have ever modeled. Uh, the, these these wind facilities, or sorry, the solar facilities, getting more efficient again, getting a lower cost, and uh, and they're able to bid in at really low and competitive prices. Saskatchewan, of course, in this Sun Belt of of Canada, here's our uh, solar potential. We're highlighted in orange and all throughout southern Saskatchewan. So we have that solar resource that led to those low prices in Alberta as well. Of course, we start talking about wind and solar. Everyone will tell you they're variable. So they're they're only available when the wind's blowing the sunshine. We, we know that. That's not a surprise. But what it means is we need to have dispatchable backup. Uh, this is taken, this is a graph from a more recent paper looking at how BC and Alberta can decarbonize their electricity systems. And there we found made a lot of sense for Alberta to build a lot more wind, a lot more solar, and to build transmission to BC so hydro could balance the variability of, of those renewables. And that transmission was really high value. So that transmission is important. So we can think about how can we balance the variability of wind and solar? We've got these low cost generation sources. What can we do to make sure that we can meet supply, meet demand when we need to? Well, we, we've seen some projects in Saskatchewan that help do that. East of Regina, the Cowessis First Nation has partnered with the Saskatchewan Research Council to create a, a, a combination of wind, solar, and lithium ion batteries. So the wind and solar are creating electricity, they're charging up these lithium ion batteries, and they've done experiments, this research council has experimented to see how steady can they make the power supply. And they can do a lot to smooth out that power supply and, and provide a, a more, uh, what looks like a, really dispatchable resource to SAS power in the grid. This is Chief Cadmus DeLorme. He's the, the chief of the Cowessis First Nation standing in front of the solar and the, and the wind turbine there. That's their lithium ion batteries in these two containers. Uh, so they're good for smoothing out that variability of wind and solar. They're not as suitable for the long-term energy storage. The, you know, if you have a few weeks without a lot of wind and solar, then lithium ion batteries are gonna run down. Uh, so we got to look at some other options for the longer term storage. We know that if, if we keep moving to electrify everything, that's creating a, other opportunities where you can have the demand side fluctuate. And instead of trying to smooth out supply to be exactly what demand is, you're starting to get demand to ramp up and down to match supply better. And so if you have a big fleet of electric vehicles and you allow that to be a demand response uh, opportunity for the grid, they can dictate, SAS Power could, could control how much of that uh, fleet is going to be charging at any given time, uh, how rapidly they've been charging. And that helps to, again, balance. We, we, we just need to balance supply and demand. They need to be equal at all times, but we can actually, with a smart grid and with a lot of electrification, we can do more on the demand side to actually uh, match our supply. We also have potential for much greater electricity trade with Manitoba. Uh, I, as uh, economists always talk about the benefits of trade, for some reason, uh, electricity systems have not been designed in the past to really take advantage of 
uh, trade opportunities. Really, people have thought in a really siloed manner about electricity. It's always a, an economic development tool within a province, and we don't see the potential often for those trade links to happen. But as I said, you've got this low cost wind and solar in Saskatchewan. Manitoba has these big hydro reservoirs. Basically, they have giant batteries that could be used to help us deal with the variability of wind and solar. So we can be selling wind to them when it's windy, and then they can be holding water back, and they can be letting the water through when it's not windy and helping supply us, but also uh, helping to sell down to the U.S. where there's a big market for electricity. And so when I you know, think about trade, I want, wanted to even think even bigger than just sort of uh, two provinces trading. The National Renewable Energy Lab in the U.S. has done some work on a macro grid or a super grid. So they're talking about building transmission lines, high voltage DC transmission lines to take low cost renewable energy from the plains of the US, which you know, we sit right above, we're part of the plains, uh, where you've got the low cost wind energy and, and good solar and building these transmission lines so you can get that electricity to the coasts where a lot of the US load is. And if you can, if you can do this, you can start to deal with the variability of renewables by linking a lot of renewables across space. And so it's always windy somewhere, it's always sunny somewhere, and it starts to, to help deal with the variability by having this big macro grid. Here's just a look at the US, but you can imagine Canada tying into that with our hydro reservoirs and even tying into Mexico to make it a North American macro grid. Uh, so I think there's a lot of potential for that. SAS Power has now joined the Southwest Power Pool so they can now market and sell into the US but we've got to build the transmission to allow that to happen. Some of the other ideas that are out there, uh, some of you might have seen a presentation by RMP about a year ago through the Energy Management Task Force, which I'm jealous of that you have it in Saskatoon. And I'm very glad that I've been able to log in because there were some Zoom versions of EMTF so I could actually attend from Regina. So I appreciate that. Uh, but the RMP group talked about the potential of air batteries, basically. So using salt caverns, pumping them full of high pressure air when it's windy or sunny. And then when it's not windy or sunny, taking that high pressure air, running it through a turbine to generate electricity. You can do that with or without natural gas. It's a bit more expensive without natural gas, uh, but they're claiming a, a cost, a levelized cost of 91 to $114 a megawatt hour, which is actually not too bad when you start to think about boundary down three was 140 to 170 dollars a megawatt hour and we don't know what the price tag is going to be on a, a nuclear reactor and electricity from that yet so this could be an interesting option and we have the right geology i, I contacted rmp they shared these slides with me we have the right geology in saskatchewan to build these salt caverns uh, and to dispose of uh, of the brine uh, that you use to create a salt cavern and I think the most fascinating thing is that you can look at, this is a map of where the salt cavern potential is. And then they overlay our existing transmission system where we have existing transmission for electricity. It's a very close match. So we have transmission right above these potential salt caverns, which means you're not having to build a lot of new transmission to new places. We're, it's, they're in the right place. So I think that's quite fortunate, something we could be looking at. I think there's there's interest, but uh, you know my understanding is RMP has yet to get approval for the project, but is still trying to get a project built in Saskatchewan. So that's an interesting one that that could end up being important. And then we look at other maybe you call them wild card technologies, things that are on the edge of what's possible. Uh, GE also building hydrogen fueled gas plants that would run on hydrogen. Of course, hydrogen is not something you just dig out of the ground it's an energy carrier not a not a source of energy on its own you have to create the hydrogen somehow there's three different ways i've got here on this slide showing you how you can do it two of them involve splitting natural gas uh, so you've got natural gas you take out the hydrogen you're left with co2 gray hydrogen that just goes out to the atmosphere that's no good blue hydrogen you use ccs to capture the co2 that's better and then green hydrogen you're combining electricity and water, splitting the water so that you get hydrogen and oxygen. And so you can do that with renewable electricity, any, any low emissions or zero emissions electricity you want. And the key there is the, electro, the electrolyzer 
and how much that's going to cost. So this is another potential for Saskatchewan. Uh, on the blue hydrogen side, this is a company in Saskatchewan called Proton Technologies. They're going into oil wells, and they found a technique to leave the CO2 in the ground and extract hydrogen from oil wells in Saskatchewan. So this, this is interesting because we know we do have this labor force in oil and gas. This is a technology that would make use of that labor force and, and move it to a, uh, a lower emissions source of electricity, potentially with hydrogen. Uh, we know hydrogen generally is, is good in terms of its energy density. The thing that hydrogen is still struggling with is the cost to produce it. So here it is in uh, US dollars per kilogram, different ways you could uh, create hydrogen using natural gas, using natural gas with CCS, using renewables for the electrolysis. Uh, we probably need that cost to be maybe 75 cents US a kilogram to get that to be competitive with natural gas and gas plants. Little, it can be a bit higher when we start to put a carbon price on, on the gas plants, but we, we need that hydrogen cost to be driven down. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk in a few slides about how that might be possible. Uh, I'm almost near the end of our options here, but it, the, the interesting thing is we do have all of these options we can think about. Uh, geothermal is another potential option. We know Deep is a company in Saskatchewan that is right now working on a 25 megawatt geothermal facility. Uh, they're using the same drilling techniques you use in oil and gas. Again, this is, uses one of Saskatchewan uh, Saskatchewan's advantages where we have this skilled labor force and we want to find opportunities that aren't necessarily in a fossil fuel based industry. Now, so geothermal has some potential, still a question mark of what that's going to cost in terms of levelized cost. And then I, I'll just slide this in here onto the screen. I'd be remiss if I didn't. So, I, I mean, I, I had an exchange with David. Yeah, I don't know if Dave Mains is in the crowd there, but uh, he he's a big booster for biomass uh, with CCS. And he has here a, a levelized cost of switching shand to, to run on biomass, uh, wood pellets from BC, and how crediting that as actually a way to take emissions out of the atmosphere would lead that to be a competitive technology. So that, that's one I haven't studied as much, but in Saskatoon, you got Dave Maines, who's a, uh, an expert on that, and you could talk to him about that option. Now, almost at the, I've gone through the options. Now I want to just look at, well, what are we actually going to be thinking about when we decide, well, what are we going to build in Saskatchewan? And as I said, I'm really focused on that cost side of things. And I think that's going to be a big, important factor. So to me, it really is going to be this cost of electricity that sits at the forefront. This is the Lazard Levelized Cost Report. Uh, they release generally every year showing a range of levelized costs for different technologies. This is, these are on US dollars, US dollars per megawatt hour. So you've got to convert to Canadian dollars. Uh, to put it in context, the residential rates we have in Saskatchewan convert to US dollars, it's about $108 per megawatt hour. That's that orange line there. Uh, of course, we, don't, we can't generate electricity at that rate and sell it at that rate because we got to pay for all the other stuff. But just to put it in context, that's our residential rate. Uh, we can see the, the, the range they put in there for solar, they've got 30 to $41 a megawatt hour US. That is right in the range of what Alberta has, has commissioned and has signed deals for. So Alberta is achieving that with their $49 Canadian or $36 US per megawatt hour contracts for solar. Wind, actually the contracts in Alberta on the lower end of what uh, Lazard is saying is possible because we have these good wind resources in Alberta and we have the same good wind resources in Saskatchewan. Uh, so that average bid they had of $37 per megawatt hour, $27 uh, per megawatt hour with current exchange rates, they're really at the low end of what Lazard says is possible with the uh, level S cost of wind. Boundary Dam 3, I put in there, it's, uh, around $100 US per megawatt hour. That's if you're selling the CO2 to white cap so they can extract oil for enhanced oil recovery. If you weren't selling that CO2 and you're just putting it underground, you'd be up to uh, 
$170 a megawatt hour. So you'd be up there to about $125 plus dollars per megawatt hour US. It's interesting then to put in some of these other options. The RMP numbers, they're saying we can get compressed air energy storage powered by low cost wind energy for converted to American 53 to $84 US per megawatt hour. That, that range is, uh, is not too bad. Uh, compared to some of these other technologies and, and it's dispatchable. With the current cost of hydrogen, they've got, Lazard has that green uh, diamond. That's a gas plant with 20% hydrogen at $4.15 uh, $4 a kilogram. So that's still, still costly when you're paying that much for the hydrogen. Uh, but if you can drive those costs down, things start to look a bit better. And we have seen, as, as I showed for solar and wind, we have seen these cost improvements. This is going to be a big factor that we've got to watch. So which technologies are going to be improving and which ones are going to have costs get driven down as we learn by doing? There's a, a really interesting paper that came out in 2022. Maybe some of you have seen it. Uh, empirically grounded technology forecasts in the energy transition. They, they talk about how we've generally overestimated how much wind and solar are going to cost in all of our climate models, because we haven't actually captured that the rate of change that's been happening and the learning that's happened as we deploy these. So they're looking at, as you build out capacity, we learn, we learn how to manufacture these things cheaper. You can see on the X axis, there's experience in terms of terawatt hours of cumulative uh, production uh, and generation capacity. Uh, cost has been driven down with that learning by doing for solar, for wind, uh, batteries on that same trajectory, which is bodes well for electric vehicles and for any lithium ion storage we want to talk about, but also electro electrolyzers on that learning by doing curve. And if they keep on that curve, what these folks are saying is that we might actually find that that zero emissions electricity pathway is the cheapest pathway to be on. If you can stay on it, you drive down the costs. So this is a a water to hydrogen electrolyzer uh, in Quebec. Uh, if, if we keep building these, we're gonna learn how to build them cheaper and that's gonna drive down the costs. They give some forecasts in that paper as to how low those costs might get. They also put some caveats in there that not every technology will have costs get driven down. Uh, not all are as compatible with that uh, model. Wind and solar, you build the components in a manufacturing plant, you're doing it thousands and thousands of times, and you're actually, the innovations are in the manufacturing process where you're driving down the cost. Same for batteries, same for electrolyzers. So they, those things you can build in a factory and mass, uh, mass produce, standardize, are the things we can really drive down the costs. Here's another paper that looks at this, uh, looking at what are the characteristics that lead to these cost improvements so how complex is the technology? How much do you need to customize it? In that bottom left quadrant, you see the mass produced technologies like solar photovoltaics, uh, LED lights. Those are the things you can really drive the cost down on. They've got wind turbines as needing a bit more customization, a bit, bit more complex, but they've still seen really nice improvements. But you see here that small modular reactors, nuclear power plants, carbon capture and storage, needing to be, well, they're fairly complex. You can't standardize them and produce them in a, a factory, although people will talk about producing the, the small modular reactors in more of a standardized way, but they call it mass customized. And it's harder to drive a lot of cost reductions for those kinds of technologies. So I think this is gonna be interesting, interesting to watch. What, it, what are the learning by doing curves gonna look like? And are they gonna stay on that trajectory of really driving down costs? The other thing that's really important is to see what our neighbors are gonna do. In the US, they've just signed a big uh, Inflation Reduction Act that gives a lot of tax credits for building out all kinds of technologies like wind, solar, batteries for cars, electrolyzers for hydrogen, carbon capture storage, nuclear, new transmission. They've got credits for everything. And it, it's gonna offer us a look at where these technologies are heading. And it's going to help to drive down those costs. So we're going to see learning by doing because of that Inflation Reduction Act. Now, I realize I'm at the 50-minute the mark. So I just have two more 
maybe three more slides to show you. We, when we're talking about all this stuff, the question you might have is, well, is this going to make the cost of electricity go up? So I, I, I've done some work on that. I, I worked on a paper for the Canadian Climate Institute. We took three modeling studies and looked at what they're saying for the cost of generation and converted that into rate impacts. The blue shaded area shows the range of possibilities from that study. The black is the, the average. The average is showing a slight increase over time. There's, there's also at the low end potential for fairly steady costs if we're deploying a lot of low cost renewables. But there's also on the high end potential for rate increases. So we'll see, and this is gonna depend on the cost of those technologies, how they get driven down. As I said, if we're driving down the cost of clean electricity technologies, these folks who wrote this paper say, we, we might have actually trillions of dollars of savings by focusing on those and driving down the costs. Now, we also know if we electrify, we're gonna spend more on electricity. So if you maybe you have a rate impact, but you're also using more electricity, expenditures on electricity will go up. That can be hard on low-income households. Electricity is not a progressive way to pay for things. Uh, it's You don't use a lot more electricity as you go up in income. So because there could be some equity issues, one thing that, that we've been recommending in that report is that you could have government at the provincial level and at the federal level help to fund the big capital investments in electricity technology to keep that rate pressure lower. And if we do that, if you pay for the electricity system with income taxes, that's a progressive way to pay for things because higher income households pay more and you're gonna relieve that burden on low income households. So I'll, I'll finish off. I mean, we've got a lot of options. SAS Power is contemplating many of them uh, and we could be pushing them to contemplate more of them. And so I think we've got we've got to help push them in the, that direction. Regulation is also gonna require them to go in that direction. And uh, let's let's get to work building that zero emissions electricity system. So thank you. Uh, I can stick around for questions now. Okay.